Hello there, and welcome to our next chapter. Here we're going to cover chapter 13. Only one section after chapter 13. 13.5. 13 all about intermolecular forces. Let us begin. All right, everybody. Welcome back here. Uh, got a short one on tap here for today. Chapter 13.5. So just that section out of chapter 13. Uh, it's about intermolecular forces. We're going to talk about intermolecular forces. Uh, we'll also talk about intramolecular forces officially. And we'll talk about some of the properties that come out from those type of forces and what they affect in terms of how molecules, for example, interact with one another. Uh, how they affect things like boiling points, melting points. Uh, so not much to do other than to get in it. It should hopefully, again, be a relatively short one. Uh, so there are two types of uh, sort of forces. There's intramolecular forces. And there's intermolecular forces. And they are sort of different um as we'll talk about here in the next couple of slides intra means within the molecule inter means really kind of between uh two molecules so uh, we're going to talk about each of these forces uh to begin with here but we're going to mainly focus in on this chapter on the intermolecular forces and how molecules behave with other molecules. So let us start with intermolecular forces. Intermolecular forces are the forces that hold one molecule together with another. Now, it could be two of the same molecules, how they're held together, like say two water molecules. Uh, it could be two different molecules, how they sort of interact with each other. And these are the intermolecular forces. All intermolecular forces, basically work through a fundamental attraction and that is what we kind of see in ionic sort of bond and that is opposites attract so all intermolecular forces are basically a simple attraction between the positive side for example of one molecule and the negative side of another and again, it's that opposite attraction that's going to hold those things together. So intermolecular forces are when you have one molecule and another molecule and the attraction between those two from opposite sides. Like I mentioned before, if we had a couple of water molecules, water again is a polar molecule, so negative side on the oxygen hydrogen more positive when we get two water molecules together the negative side of one and the positive side of the other will be attracted to each other and will bond and we'll talk about that bond shortly as to exactly what type of bond that is but that is an intermolecular force it is the force that holds that one whole water molecule this guy here together with this whole water molecule as the force that holds them together and you know whatever stage of phases they may be in in liquid phase solid phase now why are intermolecular forces important intermolecular forces are really responsible for a lot of how molecules interact with other molecules they're responsible for things like melting points and boiling points uh, so for example, if we have something that is held together again, like this, for example, this intermolecular force, and let's just say that these molecules are in the liquid phase at this point. Now at the normal boiling point, you would need to essentially add enough heat like, you know, put it under the fire. Maybe if we're talking about water or something like that, you'd ask to add enough heat to break this bond between the molecule on the left and the molecule on the right. And that would then allow them to go off, for example, into the gas phase, which is what happens right at the normal boiling point. So how does intermolecular forces affect like boiling point temperatures? The stronger 
the intermolecular force that you have that's holding those two molecules together, it means when you go to put that energy in to break those two guys apart, you're going to need a lot more energy than if your intermolecular force was a weaker force. So if you have a relatively strong intermolecular force that holds a molecule together with another molecule, especially when we're talking about the same molecules, so two like water molecules, whatever it may be, two ethanol molecules, whatever it may be, but the force that holds those two molecules together we just focus on two molecules. There's obviously a lot more. Um, if that force is a really strong force, that will translate to a higher boiling point because you have to put more energy in there to get those guys to break apart from one another. And the opposite is true. If that force that holds that together, these two molecules, let's just say you had two other molecules here, two of the same molecules, molecule A, we'll call it molecule B, and those guys are held together. Actually, we'll make them both the same. So we'll do A on both of them. Come here. So let's just say that this intermolecular force is a relatively weak intermolecular force. That means when you go to break that bond between it, say at its boiling point, at its melting point, Nah, you just got to look at it and it will pretty much break apart. You don't have to put as much energy. So less energy would be needed in this case to break those guys apart. So intermolecular forces are really important for boiling points, melting points, freezing points. And in general, the stronger those intermolecular forces are, the higher the melting points, freezing points, boiling points are. And the weaker the intermolecular force that holds those molecules together is, the lower all those things would be boiling points, melting points. In addition to within, say, the same molecule, the effect that intermolecular forces have on boiling points and melting points, it also has a really big effect on how molecules actually interact with other molecules. We talked about solubility, for example. If something is soluble, it means they really will mix. Now, intermolecular forces actually plays a tremendous effect on whether or not things will mix well. So for example, let's just say we had a molecule A and we had a molecule B, so two different molecules. And let's just say that A and B here use the same type of intermolecular force. So what I mean by that is the what A uses with other molecules of A, let's just say is one type of intermolecular force, which we're going to talk about the different types shortly. And let's say that B uses with other B molecules, the same type of intermolecular force as A uses. So in this case, they both use the exact same type of intermolecular force. So let's just say, for example, dipole dipole is an example of an intermolecular force. So they both use the exact same type of intermolecular force. That means when these guys come together, they're actually going to have a pretty good time in terms of interacting with one another because the way that they can interact with each other, the A and B, is the same way, for example, that A interacts with other A molecules and B interacts with other B molecules. So it all works really well. It makes those things to probably be very soluble with one another because they're both gonna be using the same type of intermolecular force. Now, if you had A and B and they actually use different uh, types of intermolecular forces. And again, what I mean by that is, let's just say, for example, a uses what is known as dipole-dipole interaction. And we're going to talk about that shortly, which is a type of intermolecular force. And let's just say B uses dispersion forces, which is a completely different type of intermolecular forces. When these guys try to get together and kind of mix and be soluble, it's going to be not a great situation. And it's really because the way that molecules are able to interact with other molecules, especially molecules that are different than them, 
is they try to interact the same way that they interact with themselves and other molecules that are the same. So when they come across other molecules that are different, that have the same type of intermolecular force or use the same type of intermolecular force that they use, then it's a perfect situation. They're gonna be able to mix really well in most cases. But if you have two things that are gonna to come together with very, very different intermolecular forces, you're going to have a situation where they just really don't know how to interact well with one another. So they're not gonna be able to mix very well. All right, so that's sort of an overview of intermolecular forces. Shortly here, we're gonna talk specifically about different types of intermolecular forces. But before we do, let's just take a step back and talk about intramolecular forces. So intramolecular forces, are the forces within an actual single molecule that holds it together. Uh, so for example, intramolecular forces is within the molecule. So for example, if we took one water molecule, water molecules are held together by covalent bonds, the sharing of those electrons, right? And those are intramolecular forces. And that is the bond here between the hydrogen and oxygen on that side and the sharing of electrons and the bond there between the oxygen and hydrogen on that side. Now, intramolecular forces are always stronger than intermolecular forces. So you're talking about ionic bonding, which is like electrostatic attraction, very strong. Talking about covalent bonding, which is also strong. And they are stronger than intermolecular forces. So why is that? So let's just take water as a pretty good example to illustrate this. And when we have two water molecules that are bound together through an intermolecular force, again, the negative side of one to the positive side of the other, this bond here, which as we will talk about shortly, is what is known as a hydrogen bond. That is also its intermolecular force. So why is that weaker and how do we know it's weaker? Well, we know it's weaker if you've ever boiled water, which I imagine most of you probably have or have seen it done uh, before. There's a fancy Bunsen burner there with some water. When we boil water, what actually happens is we break this intermolecular force, the bond between this entire water molecule and this entire water molecule, which allows those water molecules to go off into the gas phase, are known as steam, right? And that's what happens at its normal boiling point. And that's what the steam that we start to see obviously come out as we are boiling water. Now, what would happen if it was the opposite and the intramolecular force was actually weaker than the intermolecular force? Well, you would go and boil your water and what would happen is you would get alphabet soup. You would basically be breaking these bonds and that would give you some hydrogen gas, maybe some oxygen gas which is not so good. Obviously, we know that does not happen, right? When you boil your water. So good news is it doesn't happen. And that is how we know in a real life example here that the intermolecular force is always weaker than an intramolecular force. And that's why intermolecular forces are so important in terms of boiling points, melting points uh, along the way. So let's focus in on now intermolecular forces. So we're going to focus in on intermolecular forces here uh, for the rest of the lecture here. So intermolecular forces. And there are some different types of intermolecular forces. So we're going to start with the first one, which is what is referred to as a dipole-dipole force. Now you might remember dipole from when we talked about bonding. If you have a polar molecule, it will have a dipole moment, right? Represented with this arrow where it points at a more negative, makes it more positive, right? A little dipole moment. So what exactly does that mean? Well, it means that overall, as we talked about, 
there is some unequal sharing of those electrons within that molecule. And that creates within a polar molecule, a positive side to that molecule and a negative side to that molecule as we have a polar molecule, which means when that polar molecule is in contact with another polar molecule, which could be another one of the same molecules or different molecules that is also polar, it will also have a positive side and a negative side. That means that lo and behold here, we will have our way to interact. The negative side and the positive side of one molecule will be attracted to the positive or negative side of the other molecule. And the deal with polar molecules is they always have the separation of charge because they are polar, which means no matter what the situation is, there's always going to be a positive side and there's always going to be a negative side to that molecule, which means they are good to go to bind with other polar molecules that also have a positive side and a negative side. And this is the main type of intermolecular force that occurs with polar molecules that uh, do not have, if you want to think about it, the ability to hydrogen bond in a sense. So it's really the main one for polar molecules. Um, and I'll explain why I say they don't have the ability to hydrogen bond in a second. But uh, if they don't really have the ability to hydrogen bond, then you would describe their sort of interaction as dipole, dipole. Okay, so uh, when we have these polar molecules, again, coming together through that electrostatic attraction, the positive side of the negative side, when they do sort of come together, say in the liquid state or even in the solid state, they try to align themselves in a way that maximizes sort of that attractive force, uh, but also tries to minimize, uh, you know, the repulsion type force that we see when, you know, negatives get near negatives. So no matter what you do, um, you're always going to sort of have a positive side near a positive or a negative side near a negative, but they will keep kind of rotating, moving, vibrating about till they can kind of find a situation where they're sort of happy in a sense, uh, where they really do maximize that attractive force and again, minimize the repulsion forces. And here's a picture of that. Again, you can see, you know, there are some positives near positives, negatives near negatives, but you can see they, they really do try to kind of rotate around to ultimately maximize that attractive forces that can happen. Another type of intermolecular force, which is something that we're perhaps familiar with, is what is sometimes referred to as an ion dipole force. And an ion dipole force is pretty much what it sounds. Ions are guys that are either a cation, right? Or an anion, right? And dipole is what we just talked about, pretty much a polar molecule. So what happens in this case is they will come together. Obviously, the positive cation is going to be attracted there to the negative side of the polar molecule and the negative anion is going to be attracted to the positive side of that polar molecule. You know, you can think of this as pretty much what happens when we dissolve an ionic compound in something like water, which is polar. So if we take something like our friend sodium chloride and we dissolve it in water, which is polar, right? And again, uh, the oxygen side there of water being more negative, hydrogen side being more positive. So what happens really when we take sodium chloride and dissolve it in water is we get our sodium ions and we get our chloride ions. And what happens when we put the water in with it and give it a little mixy mixy and maybe not so much shaky shaky uh we throw a bunch of water molecules all over that solid sodium chloride and by the way the solid sodium chloride before it begins is sort of locked into place sort of in a three-dimensional kind of cube if you will and as you throw the water molecules on there you mix it around 
that's going to allow those ions basically to pop off from one another. And the water molecules will actually surround each of these ions. For example, here, the sodium ion, which is positively charged, will be attracted to the negatively charged oxygen in water. And it will surround these ions. And water being polar has also that positive side, which is the hydrogens, which will find itself surrounding the negatively charged chlorine or chloride ion. And frankly, this is the force that occurs or the interaction that occurs when we dissolve like an ionic solid in something like water, which is polar. This is also why when we look at it, we no longer can see the sodium chloride anymore because there's a bunch of water molecules all around those ions and it's no longer visible to us. Uh, and this is sort of the process of dissolving. So this is why ionic compounds are usually very soluble in polar solvents, but in nonpolar solvents, it doesn't work really well. And we're gonna talk why that is in a second, but things that are nonpolar, right? They have no charge. So there is no positive side in this molecule. There is no negative side in this molecule, which means, you know, when a sodium ion is there, they're like, uh, what do we do? Uh, we really have no way to interact well with it. Can it interact a little bit with it? It can, it will, some things will happen, which we'll talk about in just a second. But over the long period of time, it has no way to maintain that interaction. And that is why something like sodium chloride is not very soluble in something that is a nonpolar uh, solvent, uh, but definitely soluble in something like water, which is polar. Uh, so they're able to interact really well. Now, another type of intermuscular force is what is referred to as dispersion forces. And dispersion forces can occur a couple of ways, but what is dispersion forces? Dispersion forces is really the main type of intermolecular force for nonpolar molecules. For nonpolar molecules with other nonpolar molecules like themselves and interaction of one nonpolar molecule with another nonpolar molecule. And that is because, as I just sort of mentioned a second ago, when you have a nonpolar molecule, eh, for the lack of a better description, uh, they're pretty much neutral, which means if all intermolecular forces really work between a positive and negative thing, that's a little problematic for nonpolar molecules, which don't have a positive side and a negative side. So how do they interact or and how does that work if they really don't have that? There's a couple of ways that it could happen. And one way is what is referred to as an induced dipole. And that's the separation of the positive and negative charge in a nonpolar molecule that can be caused by the temporary presence of a polar molecule or an ion. And that's why it's called induced dipole. So what happens is if you have a nonpolar molecule like this and you buddy up uh, ion, an ion like a cation next to it, what's going to happen in this case is temporarily what happens is as that ion gets closer, the electrons in my neutral guy is gonna go, cool, I wanna go this way. And when it does, it creates a temporary charge in that nonpolar molecule, which temporarily gives it a way to interact with that ion. The same thing would happen if you rolled in a polar molecule here. If I can make a plus there, there we go. That would also cause the electrons to kind of shift this way, create once again, a temporary charge and a way for these guys to now interact. And in the first case, this is what is referred to as an ion-induced dipole because the dipole here normally is not there. 
but it is only temporarily caused by the ion being present. And the second one is what is referred to as a dipole-induced dipole. And that's the same idea, the polar molecule here that has a fixed dipole moment will cause that temporary shift in electrons in the nonpolar molecule, giving them a way to interact with one another. This is why, for example, you know, uh, we could use like the example of say like oil and vinegar salad dressing, for example. Uh, oil is nonpolar. Vinegar has some polarity to it. It has a polar group. So when you mix it up for a short period of time, it can interact. But as those molecules kind of move apart, those are going to break down. And those interactions with those nonpolar molecules, they're going to kind of go back to being nonpolar for a bit break apart, make new ones, go back, make new ones. So over the long period of time, it has no way to maintain that interaction. So like in the oil and vinegar sort of example, if you want to kind of think about it that way, eventually everybody's going to separate out from each other. And maybe only at the layer where they interact, you might get a little bit of interaction uh, because they can't over the long period of time maintain that interaction. How else can nonpolar molecules perhaps interact with other nonpolar molecules? And that is what is sometimes referred to as an instantaneous dipole actually occurs. So polarizability is the ability of electrons within a molecule to frankly uh, vacation on one side of the molecule or the other because they are flying around it is possible that they all could sort of migrate to one side versus the other. So for example, if we go back to our two run of the mill here, nonpolar molecules that have no charge. And let's just say, for example, for whatever reason, our electrons, which are flying around, decide to all kind of vacation on this side of the molecule. What that's going to do to our guy on the left there is is going to temporarily create a separation of charge in that nonpolar molecule. And it will now have a side that's more negative because there's more electrons there and a side that's more positive because the electrons are not there. Now, what happens when that guy is still near another nonpolar molecule? Well, the electrons in this guy is going to go, whoa, that's negative over here. No, thank you. I want to go this way. And now in the second nonpolar molecule, it will now gain a temporary separation of charge. It looks something like this. And now these two molecules that normally does not have any type of charge, any type of separation of electrons, have their electrons basically equally distributed, now temporarily get this separation of charge, and there is our positive and negative attraction that they could use to bond with each other. What happens and why this is not a very strong type of interaction? Well, what happens when these electrons decide to kind of go back to normal? They're going to kind of break apart and are going to make new bonds and break apart and make new bonds and separation. So once again, it is not a sustainable way to keep that positive and negative attraction held together over a long period of time in most cases. And this is what is referred to as an instantaneous dipole. Just instantaneously, those electrons go one side to the other. And that creates the opportunity for those things to create a temporary charge. Now, the larger the number of electrons, there is a greater chance of this happening. And this actually is what makes a dispersion force stronger. So the larger the molar mass, typically, the stronger and this is what is really known as dispersion forces, dispersion force will be. And why is that? It is that because if we have a larger molar mass, you probably have more atoms involved. And more atoms involved means you also have more electrons. 
and more electrons means there's a greater chance that these electrons could go one way or the other and create this temporary charge change in the molecule. It also gives it more places to interact with electrons and other molecules. So the strength of this dispersion force is based on the molar mass and how many electrons are there. And again, more electrons, the greater the opportunity for that to occur. So here again uh, is this idea of normally does not have a charge, nonpolar. Electrons sort of migrate one side versus the next. In this example, they would head this way creating that partially negative charge, partially positive charge, and that's an instantaneous dipole. And once again, when that happens, if it's next to another nonpolar molecule, the same thing is going to happen to that guy. And now, once again, we have our partially negative, partially positive charge. Now we have a way basically to interact with each other. So the attractive forces that arise through temporary dipoles induced in the atom are instantaneous or what are referred to as dispersion forces. And as I mentioned, they are larger or stronger in the more molar mass. So when we talk about dipole, dipole, dipole induced dipole, dispersion forces, these are commonly sometimes referred to as van der Waals forces. Um, and that is sometimes what all these guys are referred to. So at this point, in terms of the two types of intermolecular forces, we have dipole, dipole, basically, uh, which is a relatively strong intermolecular force. And this is really what polar molecules mainly use with other polar molecules. On the other end of the spectrum, we have kind of dispersion forces and these are the forces that are really used uh, by nonpolar molecules. And in addition, because of what we just talked about, these nonpolar molecules um, basically has to rely upon something happening for them to be able to do that. And that's why these are relatively weak forces. So, the reason and the difference between these, just to emphasize it is, in the case of a dipole-dipole, when we have a polar molecule, as I mentioned before, it has what again is known as a fixed dipole moment, right? like we talked about in bonding. And no matter what you do to this polar molecule, it will always have a positive side and a negative side, which means it is essentially good to go in terms of being able to interact with other polar molecules. The difference though, when we talk about dispersion forces is it is a result of a nonpolar molecule basically that has no charge, which means it's not good to go. It needs something to occur. It needs something to happen basically. Like it needs to be induced. It needs an instantaneous dipole to occur for it to go. And on top of that, once it finally is good to go, it could frankly revert back to having no charge separation. So it is not a fixed dipole. And that's why these forces are really weak because it's dependent on things to sort of happen. And that's why nonpolar molecules will have very low boiling points and melting points because frankly, they're held together by super weak forces. So again, that's why something like methane, like when you light a Bunsen burner, propane, butane, these are all like organic molecules and they're normally found as gases under normal conditions because what holds them together are these weak dispersion forces, which means under normal conditions, is not enough to hold them together. They will definitely go into the gas phase really, really easily. That's also why a lot of organic molecules, for example, are nonpolar as well. And they're very, what is sometimes referred to as being volatile, which means that they can go, even if they're not gases, they could go into the gas phase really easily because they are also held together by 
these really weak dispersion forces, which frankly, all you have to do is look at them wrong and they're gonna like pop into the gas phase. Um, and that is mainly very different than in a polar molecule situation, which like I said, it's pretty much good to go. It doesn't need anything to happen and they can lock themselves in into these dipole dipole interactions, these intermolecular forces, and they're not gonna have any trouble maintaining that over a long period of time. And again, that is the main difference between when we talk about how a polar molecule interacts with another polar molecule, be it itself or a different polar molecule, and how a nonpolar molecule interacts with itself or another nonpolar molecule. So let's take a look at this one here, take a moment. Which of the falling molecules would have the largest London dispersion forces? And London dispersion forces is sometimes what just dispersion forces are referred to as well. Take a look at those and take a second. All right, so what should I think about here with this? Well, one thing that we should throw back to bonding, which is the carbon hydrogen bond. Uh, that is a difference in electronegativity of like 0 0.4, if you remember. And that is gonna tell you that uh, this is a nonpolar bond, right? And why is that important? Well, basically all of these are carbons attached to carbons, which is definitely a nonpolar bond and attached to these carbons are hydrogens. So for example, if I drew the second guy out, it'll look something like this. Three, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I did not bad there. So we got these four carbons here. I'll throw it out there for you. Butane is what the name of it is, organic molecule. So what is this guy got going on for him? Well, it's got a uh, nonpolar bond there, there, there. Those are all nonpolar. Carbon hydrogen bonds, nonpolar. We're nonpolar everywhere here. These are all basically the same thing. They're all Carbon hydrogen bonds are nonpolar. Carbon carbon bonds have a difference in electronegativity of zero. Nonpolar, pure covalent. So the first thing that we know is, as the question said, and even if the question didn't tell you that, we are dealing with dispersion forces. So again, these are the relatively weak types of intermolecular forces. And what makes a dispersion force stronger so remember what we're talking about here is the strongest, weakest type of interaction. So between all the weakest interactions, which one here would be the strongest of the weakest? That would be, in my estimation, just by looking at the formulas here, C would be the right one. So why would C be the right one? C has the most carbons, most hydrogens, which means it has the most molar mass. And once again, as we talked about the strength of a dispersion force is resulting from molar mass. So because they have more carbons in this one and hydrogens, that means again, more atoms, more electrons, the greater the chance of polarizability happening and also the greater chance of more places for electrons to interact with one another. So remember when comparing dispersion forces, which overall is a very weak type of intermolecular force, you can rank the strength of that weak intermolecular force by the more the molar mass, the stronger the dispersion force. All right, the uh, sort of last type of Intermolecular force that we're going to cover here is hydrogen bonding. And really, hydrogen bonding is really a type of dipole dipole interaction. And it is sort of a special type of dipole dipole interaction that most people will classify it as specifically a hydrogen bond. And it is a bond between hydrogen, like the name implies and an electronegative atom. So what electronegative atoms is it? It is, whoops. It is a bond between hydrogen and you need a, it directly bonded, by the way. That hydrogen has to be directly bonded to a nitrogen, an oxygen, or a fluorine. 
why are those really important? If we look on the periodic table, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, that is your big three in terms of electronegativity, right? Remember that fluorine is the most electronegative element you could have. So when hydrogen is bonded to a fluorine, hydrogen is bonded to an oxygen, or hydrogen is bonded to a nitrogen, it creates a polar bond between these things, where obviously it is heading in this direction, meaning that the nitrogen will be more negative in this case, more positive, more positive, more negative, and the fluorine being more negative and this guy being more positive. It creates a really polar bond that positive negative attraction, which means that is what is necessary for that hydrogen bonding to occur. So for example, here we look at this guy here. This is a hydrogen directly attached to the nitrogen, means that it has the ability to hydrogen bond. It got really small on this one. So hopefully on your handout, it ain't too small, but I will try to redraw it here so we can see it. I'm not even sure what we got going on there. Mm. Let's call it something like this. This will be okay, I think. Let's go this way. I think that looks like something like this, maybe. All right. So in this particular case, uh, there is no hydrogen directly bound to that. So it cannot hydrogen bond in this case. Now, it's a really important thing to remember that this three pack here is really important because just because something has hydrogens does not mean it can hydrogen bond. So for example, if I have our methyl methane here, there is a ton of hydrogens, but not a single one of them are bonded to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. It's actually bonded to a carbon which means, as we just said in the last slide, that's really a nonpolar bond and it cannot hydrogen bond. So sometimes people think that all you need to hydrogen bond is a hydrogen, but it's not the case. It has to be directly bonded to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine to have the ability to hydrogen bond. So this is why earlier when I we were looking at dipole, dipole, I said something like it's polar molecules that do not have the ability to the hydrogen bond will typically use dipole dipole. And that's because those that do have the ability to hydrogen bond uh, will use um, hydrogen bonding as the ability. So for example, if I had something like uh, this, that is a polar molecule. It has a hydrogen, but it cannot hydrogen bond because it's attached to a carbon. But it would be able to use dipole-dipole interaction and would not be able to use hydrogen bonding. Again, this guy here, as we just talked about, would use dispersion forces. And the prime example here of hydrogen bonding is what we've been talking about with actually water. Water uses hydrogen bonding through the negative there and the positive there, the hydrogen bond. And it's able to do that because the water meets the definition that is necessary. Hydrogen directly attached to an oxygen, hydrogen directly attached to an oxygen. They're able to hydrogen bond with each other, which is a relatively strong intermolecular force. So let's talk about that. Here's an example of HF, which can hydrogen bond again because of that hydrogen directly bound to the fluorine. Remember, in this case, the fluorine would be more negative. The hydrogen would be more positive. And again, that is the interaction that we have going on because the dipole is happening in that direction. So in terms of strength of intermolecular forces, hydrogen bonding, is really your strongest, followed by dipole, dipole, and again, dispersion forces, 
are the weakest. So once again, the things that technically use each of these, and by the way, every type of molecule could essentially do some type of dispersion of forces, but it's not their main type of interaction. And that's also why, you know, like the oil, vinegar, salad dressing, they're able to interact a little bit through dispersion forces, but cannot maintain them because they're relatively weak. Now, hydrogen bond is typically what we find for polar molecules that obviously has the ability to hydrogen bond. which again means that it has a hydrogen directly attached to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Dipole, dipole, which is also relatively strong, is also for polar molecules, but this is typically what we would say polar molecules use that do not have the ability. to hydrogen bond. So, you know, an example would be like water. Example here would be like what I just put on the other page there. C, you know, something like this. And dispersion force is the weakest, and that is typically your nonpolar molecules, the way they interact. And uh, an example of that would be something like methane, for example, CH4. So once again, in terms of things like we were talking about in terms of boiling point, melting points, et cetera, these guys over here should have pretty large ones are high, I guess is a better way of putting that. And over here towards this end should have very small melting points and boiling points because of the interaction that's very weak. Here's another example of a hydrogen bond. And again, this molecule is also uh, interesting in the sense of it actually has two parts to it. And, um, most organic molecules, which is what this is, this is ethanol, by the way, um, has kind of two parts. This part over here, if we kind of look at this molecule, I'm highlighting in yellow. For the most part, this part of the molecule is actually, um, actually like nonpolar. But what this molecule does have on one end that makes it, the ability of the hydrogen bond is it has this bond right here, this OH bond. And that OH bond is actually a polar part of this molecule. And that is more negative on the oxygen, more positive on the hydrogen. And that allows it to hydrogen bond with our other ethanol molecule over here, which also has that bond, which again is more positive here and more negative here. And it also has, by the way, the same nonpolar side, uh, which is over here, which is nonpolar as well. Uh, so even things that, and a lot of organic molecules are like this, could have a part of that molecule that is actually nonpolar, but because it has this one part that actually is polar, it gives it the ability to still interact with each other and they would be soluble in each other. So for example, these definitely would be soluble in each other because it's the same molecule. But if we took something like ethanol, for example, here, if we want to talk about solubility, for example, if we took something like ethanol, just redraw it here. And once again, this is really the polar side of ethanol. It actually is going to be soluble in something like water. And that is because water, once again, has the exact same deal. They're going to be able to hydrogen bond with each other. And as I was talking about earlier, the reason why certain things are soluble in each other is they're able to use the same type of interaction that they use with themselves. So what we see here, when we look at two ethanol molecules, 
they are both using hydrogen bonding. When we look at two water molecules together, they are using hydrogen bonding. So this is what I was explaining earlier. Water and water uses hydrogen bonding as their intermolecular force. Ethanol and ethanol use hydrogen bonding as their molecular force. So when you throw together ethanol and water, they have no problem interacting with each other because they're both using the same type of intermolecular force. They're both using hydrogen bonding and they're able to do that. And that is why something like this would be soluble in water because of that intermolecular force and that interaction is similar. Now, we do have to be careful when we talk about solubility and things interacting like that because there is a problem and solubility does decrease a lot depending on the molecule that you interact say with water. So let's say for example, and I'm gonna switch the page here and here's some more examples of what we're looking at. This is ethanol and ethanol. But let's say that instead of ethanol, we throw this guy in there. I'll do this guy actually. Do that. And we're just going to do all these as hydrogens. I'll count up how many carbons I threw up there in a second. Uh, let's just say we took this guy, which, much like ethanol, for example, does have two parts of the molecule, as you could kind of see here. We have uh, definitely this part of the molecule all the way from here back as being nonpolar. We have this part of the molecule here that is polar, which has a negative and a positive. Now, if we try to have this guy here, for example, interact with water, Uh, we're going to run into a problem. And the reason we're going to run into a problem is two things are happening in this case in terms of solubility. You may be saying, well, it, it has the ability to hydrogen bond, doesn't it? It's right here. And you would be correct. But what happens in this situation is, frankly, for a lack of a better description, there's just too much stuff in the way refer to a steric hindrance, there's just too much stuff in the way to allow this water molecule to adequately get in there to interact with it. And the other real reason is when you go to dissolve, for example, something in water, and you got a bunch of water molecules. And again, we're going to get our opposites bonding here, right? And all this good stuff. And all this stuff happening. So we have the hydrogen bonding happening here. When you put something in water for it to dissolve, you're basically need to replace like water and water interactions with something that's very similar to it. The problem is, although it has this polar guy in this guy, it's just too big. It's just too big to fit good with the small water molecules. And it just won't mix really well. And it, the solubility of something like I drew up here on top is like probably nothing in terms of water. It will not be soluble in water because it just has too big of a nonpolar part. But if you have something like we had in ethanol or even this guy, which is methanol, this guy is going to be soluble in water because it can hydrogen bond. And it frankly is not a very large molecule. So when you look at these organic guys that have something like an OH group at the end of it, and if the carbon number in there is like five or less carbons, it will still be pretty soluble in water. Once you get to that like five, six, seven, eight, and keep going of carbons attached, 
the solubility drops a lot and it's almost not soluble at all at that point. So there is a limit to solubility. There's a limit to even, even though they're using the same type of intermolecular force, there is a limit to, will it still be able to be soluble in each other? And at some point, especially with these organic guys, which are basically carbons and hydrogens and oxygens, uh, when you get a lot of carbons in a molecule, it just becomes the nonpolar part becomes too big for it to interact well with polar molecules. And you see things like solubility going down. So the take home message here, what I'm trying to explain at, at this point is intermolecular forces are important within a single molecule in terms of boiling points, melting points, and you know, temperatures at where those things occur. Intermolecular forces are almost just as important or is just as important in terms of how different molecules interact with each other. It has a tremendous effect on solubility of molecules and whether or not things will mix and whether or not things will really not mix. And this is also why, for example, we mentioned oil and vinegar salad dressing, but if you've ever seen an oil spill, right? Oil will just float on water, basically. Um, and that is because oil is nothing but a long, long chain of carbons and hydrogens, which are nonpolar. So that oil is trying to use dispersion forces. Water is trying to use hydrogen bonding, not going to mix. So if you've ever seen pictures of like an oil spill, for example, in the ocean, what you end up seeing is just the oil floating on top of the water. And that's because it cannot, over the long period of time, interact and mix with the water. Uh, and that's why they separate out from each other, which I guess in that case would probably be a good thing, make it easier to clean, I suppose. Uh, let's talk a little bit about each of these here, or this one here to finish it out. Which of the falling molecules uh, would be expected to participate in hydrogen bonding? So take a moment and see which one would. All right, here. So remember to participate in hydrogen bonding, hydrogen directly bound to a nitrogen, oxygen, or a fluorine. So that is hydrogens, but they are directly bound to carbon. Not gonna work, so no hydrogen bonding there. Uh, no hydrogens at all here. Not gonna hydrogen bond. I got a hydrogen that is directly attached to a oxygen, which means check. That's going to give me again, a more positive on the hydrogen, more negative on the oxygen here, hydrogens attached to carbon. So that's no good. Same thing here. No good. No other hydrogens here. There actually is carbons and three hydrogens there, carbon and three hydrogens at the end of that stick. And those guys will not be able to do it either. So it looks like this guy right there should be the only one, which was that guy right there, that has the ability to hydrogen bond. So this concludes uh, section 13.5 in terms of intermolecular forces. Remember, really three big types of intermolecular forces, hydrogen bonding, which is somebody that has a hydrogen directly bound to a nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine used by polar molecules that can do that. And pretty much your strongest intermolecular force, dipole-dipole interaction, which is used by polar molecules that typically cannot hydrogen bond, is what we'd use that classification for. Also relatively strong interaction. And for our nonpolar guys, dispersion forces, uh, which are the weakest out of all of these type of forces because they rely upon something happening like an instantaneous dipole, an induced dipole. And that is again, how nonpolar and nonpolar molecules interact. They are a big effects intermolecular forces as we talked about on boiling points, melting points, solubility, how molecules interact with one another. All right, so hopefully this was not too long. I hope not. 13.5 in the books, intermolecular forces. That should do it for this one. Have a good one. We'll see you on the next one. Bye-bye. Hello there. And I'm going to leave you with a piece of a voice I once got when I asked somebody the question, what should you do when no one laughs at your chemistry jokes? The piece of a voice that I got was, keep telling them until you get a reaction. <laughs> <laughs>